We're going to start by talking about velocity and displacement and distance traveled. Probably familiar to most of you. We'll go through some of the ideas, some of the concepts. Uh, the idea with velocity is that it can be positive or negative. So velocity is typically thought of as a vector because it has both magnitude and direction. So if we're talking about motion along a line, it's up to us to define which direction is positive and which direction is negative. So if the velocity is positive, it means that our motion is in the positive direction. If velocity is negative, that means the motion is in the negative direction. Do we think of that as like right, left? Yeah. I mean, that's typically what we think. You know, we think about a number line like that. And we say, okay, positive to the right, negative to the left. So if the velocity is positive, it means that motion is in the positive direction on the number line that you're looking at. It could also be vertical if we're talking about dropping a ball. Or but then we could shift. You could do whatever you want. You just have to define which direction is the positive direction. And once you've defined it, if velocity is positive, it means you're moving in that direction. So displacement is a change in position. So we're going to imagine our position at time A, our position at time B. Typically in calc books, we use the letter S to represent position. Somebody wants to look up and figure out why they use S. I can't remember. It seems funny, S, but that is position. And displacement is just your change in position. So it's your terminal position minus your initial position. So in this example right here, initial position is at t equals a. And we're choosing that direction to be the positive direction. The terminal position is at t equals b. So the displacement is terminal position minus initial position. So in this case, the displacement would be positive. Because we're moving in the positive direction. We do it. The terminal position is to the right of the initial position, so we get a positive displacement. Down in this example, here our initial position is to the right of the terminal position, so the displacement would be negative. Now in both cases, the distance traveled is positive. Distance is a scalar, not a vector. It doesn't have a plus or minus associated with it. Distance would be the same whether if we go five miles in the positive direction or five miles in the negative direction, both those examples would have a distance of five miles, whereas one would have a negative displacement if you're going in the negative direction. So distance traveled different than displacement. Now when we show this mathematically, we are going to define our displacement using an integral. So we think about the fact that position's derivative is velocity. So that relationship you, you've learned, you've seen a couple of times, that if you take the derivative of position, you get velocity. And if you take the derivative of velocity, you get acceleration. acceleration. And if you take the derivative of acceleration, you get jerk. 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 <laughs> You'll learn that in physics. Then snap. So yeah, and then there's some snap, crackle, and pop in there. <laughs> So we have then mathematically that we can write our displacement if we, we know that s prime is equal to v. And if we integrate a derivative, basically the derivative and the inverse, the derivative and the integral are inverse operators of each other. So the integral symbol and the derivative symbol undo each other. We use the fundamental theorem of calculus to get s evaluated at the upper limit minus s evaluated at the lower limit. And that is, by definition, displacement. s of b minus s of a, that's displacement. Terminal position minus initial position is displacement. Terminal position minus initial displacement. Uh, terminal position minus initial position is displacement. So this gives us an integral way to write displacement. So we can always think of displacement as an integral of the rate of change. Integral of rate of change, integral of, <coughs> integral of velocity will give us displacement. Now, if we wanted distance traveled, we would have to make a, an adjustment here. 
If we want distance traveled, we would integrate speed <coughs> as opposed to velocity. Because right, velocity can be negative, but speed is always non-negative. So if we integrate speed, we will get distance traveled. So the next slide will show us an illustration of that. So if we think about the y direction as measuring velocity, time horizontally, this graph of velocity, it's positive right here. So when that velocity is positive, now when you're visualizing, you're imagining motion just on a line. Right, so you're imagining driving a car forward and backwards or a ball moving forwards and back. You've defined some sort of axis and your motion is on a line. So here, this is saying that the velocity is positive, so we're imagining our line of motion. The ball, if you will, is going in the positive direction. And then we have a time value right here where the direction changes. So here, we're moving in the positive direction, but then boom, now we're moving in the negative direction. So when velocity is negative, you're moving in the negative direction. And if we wanted our displacement, visually, we can see that the upper area minus the lower area is going to give us the displacement. This is something that you learned in Calc 1. If you integrate this curve right here, if you just integrate from A to B this function, you will get what's called the signed area. You take the area that's above the x-axis and below the curve, and you subtract off the area that's between the x-axis and the curve down below. Right, so that's called signed area. <coughs> Ringing some bells, yeah. signed area. So signed area, so if we integrate this velocity, we're going to get the upper area minus the lower area. We know that that's displacement. If you integrate the velocity function on A to B, you get displacement. So this is a visual way to think about displacement. Over here, we've changed our integral to be the integral of speed instead of velocity. Speed is the absolute value or the magnitude of velocity. And geometrically, that just takes the portion of the velocity curve that's below the x-axis or the t-axis, and it reflects it above. So now, when we integrate here, we know from Calc 1 that if we integrate, these, if we integrate this function here, we're going to get this area plus that area. So that'll be distance <coughs> traveled. Distance traveled, integral of speed, displacement, integral of velocity. You said, because I didn't hear, it was mm -hmm. signed area? We heard signed area is another area. way that this is referred to. So you think of upper area minus lower area. Like we so signed as an SIGN. Signed, yeah. signed, yeah. Yeah. Uh, signed. Like signed, yeah. Signed, yeah. Signed, yeah. Signed area. Question? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm looking for another classroom. Debra Kathleen Martin. Debbie Martin? Yeah. Uh, what classroom? Hmm. So the math department is it right behind that wall there. If you go in there, there'll be okay. somebody in there that can point you in the right direction. Just there. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, you were just there? Hmm. Hopefully somebody came since you did that last. <laughs> can help you. Okay, so yeah, we need a key to decipher you these skills. On the drop schedule. Okay, so here we have another picture of a velocity curve. And again, we're imagining motion along a line. It can be in any sort of direction, you know, whatever. We're just imagining a line with the ball or something moving along it. And what they've done here is assigned the area for each of these pieces. And then we want to answer some questions about this. Okay, so, so we've got that velocity function right there. On what intervals is the object moving in the negative direction? Where is, what is the first interval where it's moving in the negative direction? Zero. One to two. Everybody thought about it? Okay, so the first interval where it's moving in the negative direction, I hear a one to two. This table? Zero to two. Zero to two? Zero to two. This table? Zero to two. Zero to two. You guys want to change your answer? <coughs> uh -uh, one to two. I'm zero to two. Okay, zero two. Okay, so the velocity curve is negative starting right after zero. So it's moving in the negative direction for this whole piece here. 
So the okay. entire time interval from zero to two, the velocity is negative, so the motion is in the negative direction. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then when we hit two, the motion changes, and now it's going in the positive direction because the velocity is positive over here. So we're moving in the positive direction up there. Here we're moving in the negative direction. Here we're moving in the positive direction. Okay. So does that make sense? So on the on A, or, um, should we be doing it with hard brackets? With inter So that's a good question. And you could make an argument. And in math, whether you use brackets or parentheses, sometimes it does not matter. And sometimes it's purely kind of a philosophical argument. <laughs> and one could be a parenthesis, but then you'd have to make the other one a bracket. Yeah, it, well, in this, case, in this case, so on what intervals is the object moving in the negative direction? You could easily, this would be my preference in terms of being as, as uh, because you want to include zero in there, because <coughs> at zero, you do have a one-sided derivative there, so you could include zero. And I should have looked before class, but my math lab, I can't remember if they want brackets or parentheses on this type of problem. On an exam, I would take either, because it's really, it doesn't matter. And then, uh, but in my math lab, if you look at the viewing example, it will indicate whether it should be brackets or parentheses. You can make an argument for either, because on this interval, if you pick two points, if you pick two points there, there is going to be mo motion in the negative direction because the velocity is negative there. So, so but then if you were going to denote the 14 area one, the positive, would you do a... Let, let, let's finish with this first. Oh, okay, so sorry. intervals moving, in, so you could do this. Uh, let's put in and, I guess, because it's just two intervals. So we could do this. Or you could write the same thing with open intervals. And again, my math lab, I, can't, I just can't remember which one it prefers. But on a test, either of those is totally fine. On the test, I would probably say, on what open intervals, these are open intervals, or on what closed intervals. So it doesn't, doesn't really matter uh, which, but I'll, be, I'll accept either if I didn't ask precisely. But if I wanted one versus the other, I would say open intervals or closed intervals. Everybody understand the difference? Yeah. So open intervals have parentheses. Closed intervals have the brackets. <coughs> What is the displacement of the object on the interval from 2 to 6? So if we come up here and we look from 2 to 6, we're sitting in that interval right there. So what do you think? That, think about it for a second, the displacement. Think about what the displacement would be. Anyone from this table? Displacement? 4. So 4, 4, 4. So displacement is 4. So we saw above that displacement is the upper area minus the lower area. And so that would be 14 minus 10, so that would be 4. Good. And what about the next one? How far does the object travel on the interval 0 to 6? So we're going to look all the way 0 to 6, so from 0 all the way over to 6. And how far does that object travel? So we're talking about distance then. So when we're talking about how far, that's an indicator that we're talking about Actual distance area. in contrast to displacement. That's the area. Right there. That's so tight here, I can't walk. I like to wander <laughs> around. So well, this room is so tiny. So what do you guys think? Distance. 44. 44? So we add all those little sub areas together. We don't do any subtraction. So we're going to have 30 down below and 14 up above. So we're going to have 44 as our distance traveled. Correct. Bless you. And then how about the displacement on 0, 8? So all the way across. Displacement now. Negative 10. Negative 10. So that means that we ended up 10 units to the left of where we started. Does that make sense? Yep. And if somebody says the displacement is negative 10, is it clear that that gives us no information about the initial position? If I say the displacement is negative 10, that means that we ended up 10 to the left of where we started, but it doesn't tell us where we started. Right? We could have started at 10 and ended up at 0. We could have started at 5 and ended up at negative 5. So displacement doesn't give us any indication of 
where our initial position is. Just tells us what the change in position is. But it doesn't give us any indicator as to what the initial position is. So what do we say? Uh, minus 10? Describe the position of the object relative to its initial, well, we just did. So after eight hours. So 10 to the left. So that's what this question is asking. Describe the position of the object relative to its initial position after eight hours. So 10 units to the left. So let's look at the summary here. <coughs> Velocity at time t, s prime. It's the change in position per unit change in time. Change in position per unit change in time, that's velocity. Right? Change in position per time, that's velocity. Again, displacement. We integrate the velocity, and we know that velocity is the derivative of position, so the integral of velocity is position. The integral of velocity is position, and the fundamental theorem says we evaluate at the upper, end, uh, upper limit and subtract s evaluated at the lower limit. And distance traveled, integrate speed. So that'll be the distance traveled. Okay, so now we're going to kind of look at finding the position from the velocity. And we can think of this as finding the future position based on the initial position and the displacement. So let's think about this for a minute. S of zero represents initial position. Boom. And if we take our initial position and we add our displacement to it, we will get to our future position. So if we're right here, initial position, and we are told that the displacement is 10, that means we'd be over here in the future, 10 to the right of where we started. If this is our initial position and our displacement is negative 5, we're going to end up 5 to the left of where we started. So the idea here is that we're going to figure out our position at time t, knowing where we're starting, the initial position, and then the displacement on the interval from 0 to t. So position at 0, and then this will be the displacement on the interval from 0 to t. Sometimes we'll refer to this as the future position. So we've got our initial position, and we want to know the future position. We want to know the position at time t. T is in the future. Zero is where we start. Time is always going to move in the positive direction. So we're looking for the future position. So this is, uh, I would, when there's going to be a distinction. We're going to have two ways to solve the problems that we're about to look at. One is going to be using this future position theorem or model. And one is going to be using an antiderivative technique that you learned in Calc 1. Both will work totally fine. We'll refer to this as the future, the, the future position method. Um, and the other one will be called the antiderivative method. <coughs> so displacement from velocity. <coughs> um, the first step here says graph the velocity function and determine when the motion is in the positive direction and when it's in the negative direction. So that's a parabola. I expect that you should be able to graph that by now, graph a parabola. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. What's a parabola? What's a parabola? Parabolas occur. So the velocity, well, I'm going to so factor out a minus first because that will make the quadratic part look a little easier and we can probably factor it. So if I wanted to graph this velocity function that's a quadratic, you know how to complete the square, find the vertex, figure out what direction the parabola opens, up or down. And what, how about this one? Does it open up or down? It opens down. Yeah, it's going to open down because there's a leading minus in front of the square term. So it's definitely an opening down. Uh, one 
kind of shortcut that will work if it's factorable is that you can factor it quickly and you can see that, oh, okay, so the intercepts are four and one and we only care about from zero to uh, five, so there's zero and this tells us that we have we have zeros at one and four, so one, two, three, four, five, so right there. And we already decided that it opens down because we have a leading coefficient that's negative. What is the v-intercept? The v-intercept? The vertex. Not the vertex, because right. the, the function is oh. the velocity, so I'm going to put that on the y-axis. So if this was a y of t or y of x, we would call it the y-intercept. So we plug in a t value of 0. If we plug in a t value of 0, we get a v value of negative 4. So that would be our v-intercept or y-intercept, if we just want to talk in generality. So we know those points right away. And the vertex has to be at what t value? If we have a parabola opening down, doesn't the vertex have to fall right in the center of the two intercepts? Yeah. Right? It's going to have to fall right smack in the middle. So we know that the vertex has to be right somewhere in here, right? So it would be 2.5. We're one here, four here, so two and a half is in the middle. <coughs> so we can be a little bit sloppy. We can just put the vertex right there. So we would plug in 2.5 to figure out what it is. I don't really care what the value of it is right now. I'll just draw a picture because often with these pictures, we're just trying to get a sketch. And then if we want the other, the last value over here, we would plug in a five. And it looks like we're going to, are we going to, oh, yeah. Symmet symmetry, right? It's going to be right there at negative 4. Everyone agree with that? Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a sketch of our velocity function. And we can see then where <coughs> the motion is in the positive direction and where it's in the negative direction. Since this is v, 0 to 1, we're in the negative direction because the velocity curve is negative. And then from 1 to 4, we're above the t-axis, so that's going to be moving in the positive direction of our axis, and then negative right there, from 4 to 5, moving in the negative direction. So let's answer some questions then. So graph it and determine when the motion is positive and when it is negative. So, so positive direction, Let's say I say use open intervals. For positive direction, that would be 1 to 4. And again, I would tell you to use an open interval or a closed interval. And negative direction will be 0 to 1 and 4 to 5. Is the the uh, sort of the nomenclature, the plus direction <coughs> that we would write? Yeah, so on the test it would say, you know, what inter what are the open intervals that it's moving that the motion is in the positive direction? We just say, oh, plus direction mm -hmm. one to four, mm -hmm. negative direction, blah blah blah, blah blah blah, blah blah blah, <laughs> blah blah blah. So Part B: Find the displacement over the given interval. What are we going to do to find displacement? We are going to add. So is there a mathematical way to find the displacement? What would we do? Integrate. What do you guys think over here? Do we integrate? Do we take a derivative? Do we integrate the velocity? Integrate the velocity. Well done. Integrate the velocity, and that gives us displacement. Period. So displacement is the simpler concept in that you just integrate. Right? All we do is integrate. So displacement is going to be the integral of negative t squared minus 5t minus 4 dt on the interval 0 to 5. So there is our <coughs> displacement. And that's 
just a, a straightforward plug and chug. We don't have to deal with an absolute value, nothing crazy. We just do power rule. So this will give us our negative t cubed over 3 minus 5 t squared over 2 minus 4 t from 0 to 5. Somebody can plug in that 5 for us and add that all up. <coughs> Tell us what our displacement is. Displacement is zero. <coughs> Does it end up being 0? Because it's symmetrical. Mm. It's symmetric, but the only way we would get 0 is if this area plus this area, and I'm not saying that 0 is not the answer, but it just doesn't seem like it would be in my gut. The only way it would be if these two areas in yellow match the area in green. Should it be plus 5t, not minus 5t? That should be plus 5t. Thank but you. At the display yes, I see it. Yeah. Thank you. Right there. Thank you. So that should be a plus 5, which makes that a plus 5. So and then we would just do the fundamental so we, theorem of calculus. Yep, so we plug in 0, we get 0, and we have to plug in the 5. So we get minus 125 over 3. Did anyone get this all added up yet? So we have to get all those added together. And somebody will tell us shortly. And it's possible it's 0, but it's definitely not 0 because a, a parabola is symmetric. That's not the symmetry we'd be looking for. The symmetry we'd be looking for is with regard to the area. Just as much area above as below. It's 5 to 6, I believe. 5 over 6. OK. I'll trust you, and I'm sure someone else will check and tell us. All right, how about yeah, distance travel? Yeah. So what would we have to do for distance? I know. We're going to have to do the absolute value. So if we were to visualize it graphically, we would be turning those. That's a terrible, terrible dashed line. So we'd be flipping the curve so it would kind of look more like this, right? And we'd be finding all those areas. So if we wanted to do it mathematically, we would say we would integrate from 0 to 5 the absolute value. And let's write down the formula, but let's not actually carry out all the steps because it'll be one third. So right here, that is the curve. And do you agree with this? And do you agree that I could write from 0 to 1 and then multiply that curve by minus 1? So that it's t squared minus 5 t plus 4. Do you agree that that would be the distance traveled on the interval 0 to 1? Yes. All right. Do we agree with this? Because if we're trying to find this area here, you have two ways to do it that you learned in Calc 1. You're you could integrate the original function from 0 to 1 and then put a minus out in front. And all I did was distribute that minus. Or what would be the other way to find the area here? Not the signed area, but to get a positive number, to get that area. Absolute the other way would be to change the sign absolute value. So that's what I just did. I changed the sign. Right. But there's another way with the limits of integration. Um, flip the 0 and 1. Right. That's the other way. If you take limits of integration and you just interchange them, you change the answer by a factor of minus 1. So that would be the other possibility. So, <coughs> so I did it the first way we talked about. We, I took minus 1 and distributed it in. And now for the middle portion, we would want to leave the velocity function as is. We don't want to turn it to speed, we'll just, although it is speed anyway, I guess, because the velocity is positive there. <coughs> Okay, and th I actually goofed on this one. This one I should not have changed the signs, right? I wanted to leave them as they were, as they were. So that should still be minus. 
So let's carefully look at this. So our interval is 0 to 1, 1 to 4, 4 to 5. So that's where we have our transition points at 1 and 4. And then here in the middle, where the velocity was positive, I just used the original velocity function. But in both places where the velocity was negative, I multiplied by minus 1 so that we have speed over there. And that will give us the full distance traveled. And we're not going to go through that. You can do that. That's easy enough. You said the distance and the speed were the same. Wait, what this distance and speed, I never said were the well, same. No, 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 I know, I'm sorry. Distance and like speed aren't the same. But distance and displacement are the same if speed is positive. Okay. So if the, so if the velocity is positive, then speed and displacement are interchangeable. Okay. But when velocity is negative, distance is opposite of displacement. Make sense? Yeah. Can't you multiply the 0 to 1 uh, by 2? Yes. Okay. Definitely. So another possibility, because we see by symmetry, that and that are the same, so we could just put a 2 out in front. Definitely. Yeah? Wouldn't we want to distribute the negative to the, um, between 0 and 1 and 4 and 5, and not in 1 and 4? Yes, and that's what we did. So the original function has minus plus minus. Oh, I must have. So original function is minus plus minus. So in the middle where we don't want to switch the sign, we leave it as minus plus minus. Yeah, but then on the two tails, we swap them. <coughs> okay, so here, position from velocity. This is uh, what I was referring to a few minutes ago when I said we're going to have two different ways to find future position. And you've kind of seen this in algebra. They talked about the future value of investments. We're going to see this with this concept a lot, where we talk about future value. OK, so we'll do it both ways. So there's going to be an antiderivative way, and there's going to be a future value way. Either one is totally fine. The <coughs> antiderivative way probably will feel more familiar because you've seen it before. But ideally, you get comfortable with the future value method. So we'll do both. So we've got this velocity function. And it asks us about when it's moving in the positive and negative direction. So let's just put that on our, let's graph that on the interval 0 to 4. <coughs> Quick review, the 3 in front of a sine or a cosine represents the amplitude. So amplitude is the max distance traveled above or below the center line. So that's the that's three in this case. So. <clears throat> and l let's create a little. Let's pick some points on here just to be precise. If we plug in uh, t equals zero, sine of zero is zero, zero times three is zero. So we're right there. The next place that sine is equal to 0 would be when t is equal to what integer moving through this interval? Pi over 2. Not quite, because we have the pi right there. Oh, yeah. So Big what pi. value of t? 0 t, sine of 0 is 0. If we plug in a 1, we'd have sine of pi. If we plugged in a 2, we'd have sine of 2 pi. If we plugged in a 3, 3 pi, 4, 4 pi. What would be the next value of what the next t value that would give us a zero here? T equals one. one. Because sine of pi is also zero. If we look at a unit circle, we know that sine, ooh, bad ink. Sine, the sine function is zero at those two places. So when the inside is zero, the value is zero. When the inside is pi, the value is zero. If the inside had a value of 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, 6 pi, so every pi, we will have a sine value of 0. So this tells us that we have intercepts at 1, 2, 3, and 4. And so the sine function is going to go up to 3. So it will look like that. And the high value will be 3. The low value will be minus 3. So there's our velocity curve. <coughs> Any questions on the graph? <coughs> OK. 
So, and I think it's pretty clear by now if this is a velocity function that the velo up here we are moving in the positive direction, down here we're moving in the negative direction. So that's pretty straightforward now. So determine the position using both the antiderivative method and the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to call that the future value method. So the future value method and the antiderivative method. So here's how we're going to do it. So let's first do it in the way that you probably are comfortable doing it already. So we have a velocity and we want position. So we know that we integrate velocity to get position. So we know that s of t, the position at time t, is going to be the integral of the velocity at time t And when we integrate this, so I don't put limits on this. No limits, just an antiderivative, not a definite integral. So this is an indefinite integral. We don't put limits on it. And let's see what happens. So we get s of t is equal to integral of the sine function. Negative cosine. Negative cosine. So negative 3 cosine of pi t. And then we have plus one extra piece. Plus c. times pi. There's definitely going to be a plus C. Maybe I should have said two extra pieces. And then something has to happen with that pi. Times pi. Not quite pi. times. So when you're differentiating, you multiply by the derivative of the inside. But when you integrate, you're going to have to divide by the derivative of the inside. So we'll, we'll talk. Oh, let's put an S in there, too, for <laughs> cosine. So we're going to divide by pi. We'll talk, a we'll talk a lot more why, the, if that's not 100% comfortable, don't sweat it right now. We will get into the details of why that is what it is in the very near future. But you do know that if you were to differentiate cosine, you would get minus sine of pi t times pi, and that pi would cancel with that pi, and you get back to where you started. But we'll worry about the details of that later. Okay, so this position has this random constant out here. We need to figure out what that is. We find that constant by using our initial position. So we come down here and we say, oh, s of 0 is 1. So if we plug in 0 for t on both sides, we're going to get a 1. So s of 0 is 1. If I plug 0 in on the right, that should also give us 1. So we have 3 cosine of 0. 0 times pi is 0. Divided by pi plus c. This tells us that we have 1 equals, let's see, cosine of 0. One. Cosine of 0 is 1. So we have minus 3 divided by pi plus c. And then what we would do is solve for c. So c is going to be 1 plus 3 over pi. And that will tell us our conclusion then Therefore, the position at time t, the future position, the future position is going to be minus 3 cosine of pi times t, all divided by pi, plus our constant. So that is our future value. So we took our initial value, which was our position at 0, and we built the future value. And so they said on the interval 0 to 4, I believe. So, and this goes beyond 4, but from z any, if you plug any t value in here between 0 and 4, you will get the position. Right. So that is our future position based on our initial position and our velocity. So we were given the velocity. Now, if we were just given the velocity, that's not enough to find our future position, to find a specific position. Because displacement, if we just integrate this, we get displacement. That's not enough. We need some initial value to pinpoint. And you all know that through antiderivatives, right? If you integrate x, you get x squared over 2 plus c. Right? An indefinite integral is an infinite number of curves. So if we look at the integral of x dx, we say that's x squared over 2 plus c. Right? For every value of c, you have a different parabola. So there's this, this infinite collection of parabolas. This initial value then targets one of those. So that's what this initial value is for. If we just have the displacement, 
we're in this situation where there's an infinite number of choices. And our initial value pinpoints the one antiderivative. So, so now, question? You, you just took, just real recap real quick, you took a uh, velocity with a definite integral and turned it into the With an e. indefinite integral. I thought you were giving it 0 to 4. Right, so, but that's, that's what different. So they're asking for, so this piece right here is a little misleading because it makes you think you want to put this as a definite integral. <laughs> right. But the question is asking for the future position for t greater than or equal to zero. So not just okay. the distance or displacement on zero to four, it's saying what is the future position. So that's a little misleading right there because that you would plug in if you wanted the displacement on the interval zero to four, or you would take the absolute value of the velocity if you wanted the distance traveled zero to four. So this question uh, right here has nothing to do with the zero to four. When you're finding the future position, the only extra piece of information you need is the initial position. Got okay. So it's gotcha. a little gotcha. 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 it's a little confusing because it seems like you should be using the zero to four for that, but you, you don't. Right. Okay, so let's do it using the future position model. This was the antiderivative model. Right. And now let's use the future position model. So the future position model says that s of t will be the initial position plus, now here we have to be a little careful with notation. So <coughs> integral, we want to end up with a function of t. We want a function of t. So over here, I'm going to put the velocity function. And the way they gave us our velocity was as a function of t. But we want to use a dummy variable here because I want to end up with a function of t. Let me, let's come off to the side and let's just look at a super simple analysis. You tell me whether I'm going to do this. And let's do an x dx, and then do this, and we'll go from 0 to x. Both of these are functions. Neither of them is a number. If you integrated from 0 to 3, so if you had a just a numerical limits, this one is a number. And that variable is called a dummy variable because it's not a variable. It's going to vanish in a split second. We integrate. We get x squared over 2. We integrate on the interval 0 to 3. We plug in our values and take the difference. We get 9 halves. So this is just a weird way to write a number. That's not a function. That's a number. Because in the end, we have no letter in there. That's not, there's no variable. So that's not a function. Down here, this is going to be a function. And my question to you is, is this integral here, is that a function of x or is that a function of t? This is a function of t. Because when we do our integration and our fundamental theorem, we end up with a t in the answer. So that's a function of t. As t changes, that answer changes. And again, the x is a dummy variable. The x vanishes. The x goes away. So this is a function of t. So if you have a t in the limit of integration, that's really a function of t, not a constant like up here. This is a constant. Down here, this is going to be a function of x. In this case, t is the dummy variable. We're going to integrate from 0 to x, and we're going to get x squared over 2. All right. <laughs> so we just have to use that to our advantage when we look over here. We want a function of t in the end. So should there be a t or an x up here? T. A t. And we just pick a dummy variable here. Usually we'll just use x. You could use anything you want. But the dummy variable is going to go away. It's not really a variable. So let's see if we can plug in the pieces. So they tell us s of 0 is 1. So that just goes right here. 1 plus integral 0 to t. And now we take our velocity function, and we're going to use an x as the dummy variable. So the velocity function is right there, but we're going to use an x as the dummy variable. So we'll do 3 sine of pi x. 
3 sine pi x with respect to x. So this is the future position model. The future position model says take your initial position and then find the displacement on the interval from 0 to t. If you integrate velocity on 0 to t, that's your displacement. So conceptually, this matches with what we talked about earlier. If we know our initial position is here and our displacement is positive, we're going to end up over here, our future value. If we start here and our displacement gives us a negative, we're going to go this way, and this will be our future position. So this will give us a future position on the interval 0 to t. So now we just integrate, and we should get the exact same Oops. We should get the exact same function. So here we integrate, we get minus 3 sine of pi x divided by pi. Cosine. <coughs> Thank you. 0 to t. So this will be 1 minus 3 cosine of pi times t over pi minus the value at 0. So minus, plug it in 0 here, minus a minus becomes a plus 3 cosine of 0 all divided by pi. <coughs> cosine of 0 is 1, so we get 1 plus 3 over pi as our constant, minus 3 cosine pi t over pi. And one plus three over pi is our constant, and then minus three cosine pi t over pi. So same exact answer. Why is there um, on the left of that last line one minus here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what? Can you just go over those next two terms? This term and this term. Yeah. Okay. So the one is just dropping. This right here is an antiderivative of this. Mm -hmm. So the derivative of this function is that function. Mm -hmm. So this is an antiderivative. The fundamental theorem of calculus says take any antiderivative, plug in the upper limit, and that's what this is. So minus 3 cosine, oh, I'm plugging in the okay. t for the x. The minus is drifting down with it. And so then that. subtract off what you get when you plug in the lower limit. So the so third term is the um, part of the c value, 3 over pi. So it's, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So when we plug in that 0, we get the cosine of 0 being 1, so it simplifies to that constant, 3 over pi. Yeah? Can you explain why the, the second term, the 3 cosine 0, there's no pi? Right here? The next one. Here? Yeah, why there's no pi? Yeah, next week. Okay, so we're plugging in x equals 0. Oh. So it's cosine of pi times 0. So we could put a pi times 0, but we know that pi times 0 is still 0. Does that make sense? Any other questions? So I, my guess is that most of you will probably feel like this is the more intuitive way to go. The one roadblock there is you've got to be careful you don't use the 0, 4, which is going to be tempting. So if you're going to use the antiderivative method, you are using an indefinite integral. And with this method, the thing that gets most confusing to folks is that you have to, use, you have to sort of change to a new dummy variable. Because the v is given to you as v of t, it's tempting to write t in here. But you can't have t in here and up here unless you change one to a capital T or something. All right. So you said the first method was the? Antiderivative method. Okay. So the antiderivative method uses an indefinite integral, and then you solve for C with your initial value. The future value method uses S of 0, your initial position, and then adds the displacement on the interval 0 to T. So on that last question, when it said on 0 to 4, is that? Um, where it's defining the, the domain of the function? Yes. But it's asking for any t, not just between 0 and 4. Right. So there, the way they phrased it, you're thinking of that t is between 0 and 4, but they could have said 0 to a million. Or 0, they didn't even have to dictate the interval. Okay. The only reason they put the 0 to 4 there is so that we could graph it from <coughs> 0 to 4. Bless you. Okay. 
right? But they could have said 0 to 100, and it would change nothing except the graph. Right? So if they asked us the displacement on 0 to 4 and the distance on 0 to 4, but we didn't need the 0 to 4 for any part of the antiderivative method or the future value method. So it's a little misleading because they didn't even actually ask for anything that had to do with the 4 except the graph. Right? That's all they asked. Okay, so let's generalize this concept of future value then. Just like velocity can be used to find the future position, acceleration can be used to find the future velocity. So we're going to create a parallel setup. So with the other one, we had s on the left and v inside the integral. And on this one, we're going to have v on the left and a inside the integral. So if you integrate acceleration, you get velocity. Just like if you integrate velocity, you get position. So same exact scenario. So this tells us that our future velocity is the initial velocity plus the displacement in velocity on the interval from 0 to t. So this will represent displacement in velocity. All right. And here we're going to go do the same thing, but just generalize it to different functions that aren't as physics-based as velocity and acceleration. So here we're just talking about future quantity, which is kind of what you did in pre-calculus when you were doing those uh, radioactive decay problems. You're trying to figure out how long it took for a, for a radioactive element to decay. It's that kind of thing where you have a more general scenario. So again, the future value of Q, some quantity, will be the initial value of that quantity Q plus the displacement in Q. So when you integrate from 0 to T, the derivative, that's just giving you the displacement in Q. It's giving you Q of B minus Q of A. All right, so let's try another problem. Position and velocity from acceleration. All right, you guys try this one. So find the position and velocity of an object along a straight line with the given acceleration with those initial conditions. So start with acceleration, find your velocity, and then find your position. So find your velocity first. We'll stop there, make sure you're on the right track, and then position. If, you, if it all makes a ton of sense, you can blaze through right to your position. And raise a hand if you want me to come and point you in the right direction if you're a little confused. I challenge you to try to use the future position or future uh, velocity method as opposed to the antiderivative method. See if you can manage it that way. So if the acceleration, would the velocity just be negative 32 x, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. cool. So mm -hmm. it's negative to negative. So hand up if you're if you need a little nudge. Now we have Your general rule of thumb is the integral of acceleration is velocity. Right, so the integral of velocity is position. How it works is the initial position yeah. is zero. Going from left to right, so the new one becomes a constant. So S of t is yeah. equal to basically zero plus Yes. Yeah. If you want to see the, if I go backwards, if you want to see this example or the formula. So we're starting with acceleration. We're trying to find future velocity. So we're going to do integral zero to t of acceleration. Just nudge me in the right direction. So I found the, the velocity basically, right? So then the, we're going to do the S of t. So this would be negative 32. So if you. So we want to keep our letters consistent. 
So you have, you have a, well, you have a T here and an X You're right, there. Right, sorry. I got nervous. It's all right. And then uh, we need a constant of integration. If you're integrating 32 or negative 32, you get negative 32 T plus C. That's right. Oh, I messed up. And now you plug in your initial velocity. So where I plug in this whole function. So what we know is that at time zero, they said the velocity was what? Zero. Zero. They said that they s it was uh, S of zero is equal to zero, right? That's initial position. Yeah. Oh. Oh, the initial velocity. V of zero is just the X. Okay, so, so now if you plug in zero here, each of these T values here, V of zero is 50. And then take the 50 equals C. You can kind of intuitively see here too. Oh, oh, it's it's zero. Zero. For me. Your initial velocity yeah. is the same. More and more initial velocity is the same. So that would basically be said become V of t will be negative 32 t plus 50 because we moved it from. Mm -hmm. The left side to the right. So, right. 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 so we did. Uh, like so, yeah, so, 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 we, so, so we all we so all we did was. Yeah, I don't actually don't have the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, just check out with these. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. You don't have to. So you take the integral of the velocity. Differentiate like antiderivative. Something with b to the c. I just forgot the phase you said. Everything else is just like a chain. So you're using the antiderivative yeah, technique where you so integrate it and then you plug in your initial value to solve for c. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, yeah, plug your c back in. Yeah, although you say c is zero yeah. here, but it's so yeah, I messed up. That, so oh, I, I heard you. You said initial position. Yes, yeah. I thought it was zero. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So basically, what we're doing position is zero. Is we're taking the antiderivative we're just taking all the slopes of each equation and then putting it together and finding this. So I think it's going to have the whole equation. That's what we're doing right now. So first, you have the acceleration, which is the AT, and I kind of say it's taking hydrogen, and I find it a little bit of a Yes. And then add a constant. Back on the other side. And then we go back to the same hydrogen. Yeah, you can't integrate what it's so it's that's what we're doing. Nothing you can do is that. Well, when you take the antiderivative of the acceleration, it becomes a lot of whatever function value is. A of x is an abstraction. Acceleration at time x. We don't know because they replace it with x. And so, so you know how you like the zero and the velocity equations are right now, right? And yeah. <laughs> that basically got rid of everything but the constants. So, the constant so we're given, so acceleration is just a constant, so this should be So right now we're just trying to find the equation. So integrate equation 32, you get acceleration is 32t. Velocity is All right, we'll go ahead and do it on the board now. We'll walk through it. I looked it up in S. Yeah. His position for space. Yeah. Interesting. That makes perfect sense. Most of the math we do is in three-dimensional space, so they're using S to represent space. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Did you look that up? I thought it was going to be some. I thought it was going to be some Latin thing. No, I, I thought it was speed. 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 Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. I saw most of you are most of you are inclined to do it the antiderivative way, of course, because that's what you've done before. <coughs> let's do it the future position way. Okay, so we're trying to find velocity at time t, knowing the initial velocity plus the displacement on the interval zero to t of the acceleration. 
So acceleration is a constant in this case, and I need a dummy variable, so I'm going to use an x. So that would be using the future position method. And then we plug and chug our v naught or our v of 0 is 50. And we are going to integrate with respect to x. So we're going to get a negative 32x. And the fundamental theorem says that we evaluate on the interval 0 to t. So this will end up being 50 minus 32 times t. So that is our future velocity given the acceleration and the initial value of velocity. So that is what we are looking for. This is the velocity that you are looking for. So that's our future velocity. Now we're going to do the same type of thing with position. So our future position our position at time t, where t is some number beyond 0, some future t value, is going to be the initial position plus the displacement of 50 minus 32t. Oops, I need a dummy variable, 32x. <coughs> so that will give us Let's see. We see that s of 0 is 0. So that part's just going to vanish. That will be gone. And we integrate down here. And when we integrate down there, we get 50 times x minus 16 times x squared on the interval 0 to t, which will be 50t minus 16t squared. That will be our future position. Questions? Someone must have a question. When we're doing this on the test, do you want us to just oh forego noting plus c when we're doing this? Well, with the future position it's method, you don't use the plus c. Don't use the plus c because it's just plus c or plus the same. Because uh, instead of the plus c, we use the v of 0 and the s of 0. Okay. Right? Because with the future value method, we use a definite integral, so we don't have to deal with the plus c, right? What is the advantage of that? The advantage of that is more conceptual than practical. Okay. Using the other technique, the antiderivative technique, works totally fine, except you have a little bit of extra work because you have to solve for the c and then back substitute it. Okay. Here we don't have any back substitution. We're just moving forward through the problem. Okay. So it's a little bit faster. But conceptually, it's a really good idea. It's a good skill. It's a good concept builder to think about the future velocity as the initial velocity plus the displacement in velocity. So the displacement of velocity. That's a good concept to think of. Um, because both answers end up equaling the same thing, could you derive each formula from the other one, like <coughs> the two different methods? I think I heard what you said. So you have the two different methods. The antiderivative method versus the future yeah, value method. Since they equal the same thing, could you get one from the other? Yeah. Yes. For now. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So you can take the strategy for initial value and turn it into antiderivative or vice versa. Now another thing to observe here is that we know that derivative of position is velocity. So if we come over here, when we take the derivative, we get exactly the velocity. And if we take the derivative of this, we get minus 32, which is the acceleration. So we get that physics relationship, which we'll see in time. Yeah. Oh, so um, is that the standard form for physics? Yes. To use? Mm -hmm. OK. Yep, they would def definitely use that method. OK. <coughs> OK, let's, I think I want to put off the next two slides. The very last slide is just a summary, so there's no, no math here, it's a summary. But we have one more word problem, and I'd rather start 6-2 than do that word problem at this moment. Um, so either I may do this uh, in my office and put it up in the notes done, or we could just do it on Thursday. But I want to get to the next section so that, you're, um, <clears throat> that you have enough, enough uh, lecture material that you can go do homework all the way through 6-2. So let's do a little bit of 6-2. And 6.2 is a practical section in that we're going to 
solve some really, really concrete problems. And it's also a great geometric section. It's going to extend some of the <coughs> integral geometry that you learned in Calc 1. So let's go ahead and talk about how to find the area between two curves. And some of you may have done it in Calc 1 already. And you actually have done it a little bit, even if you didn't know you were doing it. Um, but the idea is that we are going to modify our integration element to get the area between two curves. And what I mean by that is that we are going to draw a vertical line here and think of that vertical line's height. And we're going to integrate that vertical line's height to get this area. And that kind of parallels what you did in Calc 1. In Calc 1, you found the area under a curve. So if we had a curve, you imagined a height element right there, but it, it stopped at the x-axis. And so whatever this function is, we'll call it y equals f of x, what you learned on the interval a to b was that the integral of f of x on the interval of a to b, that's going to give you the area beneath the curve here. Now, one thing you can think of is that your lower curve is the x-axis. It is the function. It's the function y equals 0. So you really did find the area between two curves. It's just that the lower curve was the x-axis. So over here, it's just a little bit different. But the part that's the same is that the function you need to integrate is the function that's measuring the distance between these two objects, the two objects being the curve and the x-axis. So over here, the function that we want to integrate is the function that measures the distance between these two objects, between these two curves. So it's going to be, our goal is going to be to find the distance between these curves, which will be upper curve minus lower curve. Right? If you have two y values and you want to find the distance between, you would take the upper y and subtract off the lower y. So upper minus lower will give you a vertical distance. OK, so that's sort of the concept in your head, that you want to integrate a height function to get area. Integrate height to get area. In Calc 3, you will integrate area to get volume. volume. So in here, we integrate height to get area. And in Calc 3, you integrate area to get, to get volume. So that same pattern is going to persist with one extra dimension. So now let's go back to the whole Riemann sum thing that you did in Calc 1, where you motivated the definite integral. Right? The definite integral came from a Riemann sum. That's how it's defined. So let's just think about how we would generate a Riemann sum here. So if we're trying to find the area between these two curves, the idea is that you create subintervals. And on each subinterval, you have a rectangle. So if we subdivide our domain on the x-axis here, we subdivide it into n rectangles. Then we'll call the width of each rectangle delta x. D is Greek letter. Delta is Greek letter D for difference. So that's a difference in x. And the width of each subrectangle will be the whole interval length b minus a divided by the number of rectangles. So b minus a over n. That's the width of each one. All right. Then we pick a random point in the subinterval. In Calc 1, you had to do this very precisely. You did left end points, right end points, midpoints. We're not going to do that here. In Calc 2 and Calc 3, we just go with the concept. So the concept is that we have a rectangle. We know the width is delta x. To find the height, we pick any random point that we want in our subinterval, and then we plug it into the function to get our height. So here we're just going to do it conceptually. We're not going to actually do in Calc 2 or Calc 3 precise Riemann sums, which can drive you a little bit batty doing all the delta x stuff. OK, so we pick a random point. We get a height for a rectangle. Now we've got the rectangle. The height of the rectangle is the upper function minus the lower function. So that gives us the height. We now have the width. We multiply the two together to get the area of the rectangle. So that's what this is. So the height of the rectangle is f minus g. The width of the rectangle is delta x. 
Multiply that together, we get the area of the rectangle. Now we add all the rectangles together. That gives us an approximation for the area between the two curves. And then we do the magical hand waving. <laughs> and the integral, when you let n go to infinity so that you have an infinite number of rectangles, the summation becomes an integral. So the Riemann sum, Greek letter, sigma, s for sum, becomes this thing that looks like an s for a sum. So we're summing up all the little rectangles to get the total area. So we're thinking about f minus g dx as our integration element. You're imagining just this little thin rectangle. That's your integration element. So we've got this vertical integration element. And that gives us the area between the curves. So let's do one. It's actually remarkable. So we have two curves here. We have the y equals x curve. We have the y equals x cubed curve. And I know you all see the symmetry that we have here. So let's be clever. And let's say, let's just focus on this part over here. Because we know that we can um, find the area on this right side and do what? Multiply it by two. Yeah, we can multiply it by 2. So let's focus on finding that. Oh, that doesn't like to stay squiggly. We'll focus on finding the area in that little yellow region, and then we can double it to find the total area between the two curves. So here's what we need to do. We want to visualize our area element. And so our integration element, I imagine a little rectangle like that. And that integration element travels from the left end point of zero, it travels. You can imagine it anywhere in this inter anywhere along the interval or inside the region. So that's your integration element. We need to know the area of that little integration element. The thickness of it is dx. The height of that integration element is the upper curve minus the lower curve. Upper y minus lower y gives us height. So then height times dx. So here's what we'll do. So the area is going to be 2 times. So 2 because we're doubling. We're going to integrate from 0 to, I can see it. Can you see it? What's the, what's the intersection point here? <laughs> 1? Yeah. Right, if you plug a 1 into both these functions, you get a y value of 1. So the ordered pair there will be 1 comma 1. So we're going to integrate on the interval 0 to 1. And then we're going to find the height. So the height is x minus x cubed. And the thickness, or the width, is dx. So this right here, the whole thing including the dx, that's our integration element, right there. That's our integration element. We integrate that height function, and we're going to get area. So we go ahead. The 2 is out in front. And we end up with x squared divided by 2 and x to the fourth divided by 4. 0 to 1. We can distribute the 2 if we want just to clean it up a little bit. And we fundamental theorem of calculus, we plug in the 1, we plug in the 0, and we take the difference. Plugging in the 0 doesn't contribute anything, so we really just need to focus on plugging in the 1. 1 minus 1 half, so 1 half. That is the area between those two curves. Not too bad. So upper curve minus lower curve multiplied by dx. And then integral with integration limits being the left and right endpoint of the interval. And that gives us the area in between. So that's both that we, so if we wanted just one of these regions, that area would be one quarter. One quarter right? So half, we, in it, we already doubled, right? So we doubled from zero to one. So what we ended up with was the total area all the way across. So just a single area would be one fourth. All right, it's pi o'clock. It's time to go. <laughs> pi o'clock. Vamos. You don't have to do left or right. Or okay.
Nope. Don't have to do right and left or center. Yeah, those things can drive you bad. Yeah. All right, y'all. It's good to see you. See you on Thursday. Get log into my math lab. Start some homework. The i7 8th generation processor. Get the 4K screen.